a colt that has never been ridden, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing? Untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the field. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everyone, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, on this Palm Sunday, we pray throughout the world that people will recognize the holiness of this week and the resurrection of Easter Sunday. We ask for your prayers to come upon us. We pray in particular for the Pope. I understand he's ill and can't give his message today, but we lift him up in prayer and we pray that his message and the Christian message will resonate throughout the world, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and the Savior of the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we are on Palm Sunday again. We look at Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, and we look at the history of Holy Week. Pascal said this, God is felt by the heart and not through reason. And so it is my prayer that during this coming week that we will feel the presence of God in Jesus Christ and his resurrection and future coming, not by reason, but by our heart. To feel the gospel message resonating throughout our body by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look at Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, first of all, it's the instructions. Upon reaching the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead to Jerusalem, telling them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a colt and a donkey. Untie them and bring them to me. Now, when we look at the place of Bethage and Bethany, it's within a short distance of Jerusalem, so it will be less than a day's journey. But he's coming into to Jerusalem with an errand. The disciples followed Jesus' instructions and returned with the animals. They threw their garments in the beast bats for Jesus to sit upon. As Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, the crowds are beginning to gather. They're yelling Hosanna, which means save us, save us. It's repeated twice in Mark, which is the earliest gospel written, basically to the Jewish people. It was written around 40 AD, 50 AD, somewhere around there. And this word Hosanna is save us. Such an appropriate word for us today, to save us, to save us for the kingdom of God to come upon us. You see, this reception, the crowd gathered as he entered the village. They were throwing palm branches down and they were yelling and screaming. But then a few short days later, as usually the custom, people begin to turn their backs on Jesus. As he's being brought before Pilate, 
as he's being brought before the cross, he's being mocked. But here, he's being welcomed. Being welcomed. Now, there's another part of the story at the time that Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. Pontius Pilate, who we know, is mentioned in the Apostles' Creed, as we read it this morning. And so he is entering through another gate of the city. There's several gates going into Jerusalem, a very large city. But he is coming in on a horse with soldiers behind him with a, with a mighty force of the Roman army. But Jesus is coming in peace, not with an army, only with himself, knowing that he was going to die on the cross, that they would turn on him. You know what is so crazy about people and crowds of people when they gather? Look at the Super Bowl when your team is winning. You're yelling and you're screaming. But then when they lose, there's this disappointment and they turn against them. I couldn't help but yesterday as I was watching television with Princess Kate, of thinking about the royal family in England. The king has cancer. They're keeping very quiet about it. Also with Kate, <laughs> over the past couple of, of weeks, when she didn't realize that she had cancer, they put out a photo and right away they're saying, well, they touched up the photo. There must be a conspiracy going on here. What's going on? And then Kate gets on a bench in a little garden, dressed very plainly as any young woman would. And she began to talk about her condition with her doctors. And she also, at the end, was offering hope. Hope to people with cancer or any illness. Hope to anyone who was in trouble. She was offering hope. And then immediately after that little segment ended, the news media began to analyze it. Well, the first thing that one woman said, she wasn't wearing makeup. What? Cut me a break, lady. She wasn't wearing makeup. Oh, heaven forbid. Give them time to recover. Give them time. They're in a serious crisis right now. Give them time to recover. You see how crowds can turn against you very quickly? And now all the postcards are coming in and all the politicians of the world are saying, we hope you get well, we're with you. It should be like that all the time, that we're with each other to offer hope. And then the acclamation. Great excitement was created in the city when the crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And so on this Palm Sunday, the church processions, the custom of reenacting Jesus' triumphant entry, began as early as the 4th century in Jerusalem. Four centuries later, and this tradition continues to today. Then there are scriptures reading about the passion, which recounts the last days of Jesus Christ. And I hope this coming week, as you leave today, that you'll take your Bible after the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem, up until Holy Thursday, and I hope you'll come out on Holy Thursday here at seven o'clock, as we remember the Last Supper. But during this week, we have to mention the cleansing of the temple. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And then in the Gospels, Jesus speaks in parables about the kingdom of God, short little passages. He talks about the parable of the wicked tenants, the parable of the wedding banquet, and then he responds to questions from people because he cares about what people think 
and he begins to answer their questions. He begins to talk about the question about the resurrection posed by the Sadducees. This is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then the question of the greatest commandment, where a Pharisee lawyer tries to test Jesus and his response. And then there's the anointing at Bethany and Judas' betrayal. This is a very important day of the life of the church. It is a story of great humility, of Jesus taking on the humbleness of a servant of God. It talks about the coming of the king. There was a, a story several years ago when Bill Clinton was president of the United States that there was a terrible hurricane in Florida, which there have been many. But he was going to Orlando, and as the crowds were watching, they saw his airplane coming in with two other jets to protect him. And it was like the entrance of the leader coming and saying, I care. You see, this is what Jesus was doing. Is he was coming into Jerusalem on a horse. I care about you. I care about what's happening in your life. And there is an answer. Also, it was clear he was announcing to the world that he was the Messiah. There's even a question today, who is Jesus? There are some that say, well, he was just a good philosopher, a theologian, a good man. We as Christians say he was the son of God, which, is, which isn't recognized by a lot of people throughout the world. But it was Zachariah's prophecy that began to threaten the established order. Or as the religious leaders of the day, when they saw this Jesus or heard about it, we got to do something about him. We have to eliminate him. He's going to take away our power. And so during the course of events during the week, that's what they did. They offered up to the crowd, Barabbas or Jesus, a murderer, a rebel, who do you want? And they pointed at Jesus and said, Crucify him! Crucify him! And they let him away and let Barabbas go free. And of course, the most amazing thing is that he did not, that he did it for all of you and me. And we need to ask the question are we worthy of the sacrifice? There was a true story that was printed in a, in a journal by a president of an Ivy League school. And some of the young men of the school who came from very rich families began to tear apart things at the school. They were doing damage to the school. And when they were caught and brought before the, the president of the university, he said, you know, I'm why did you do it? Well, what's the big deal? What's the, the damage? What, how much did we destroy? He said, it was a lot of money. And this one kid said, well, don't worry about it. My father will pay for it, and it's all over. We can pay it off. And the president said, that's not the point. It's your behavior that I'm concerned about. And I can't overlook it. I can't overlook what you did. Well, for us today, as we come and as we worship, it is important for us to realize our responsibility within the church. There's a song of Solomon that I'd like to read at this point. It represented the kind of son of David whom the people were expecting. They weren't expecting this type of Messiah. They wanted someone like David. They would come in and defeat the Romans and establish their own kingdom again. 
And this is what the Song of Solomon says. Behold, O Lord, and raise up unto them their king, son of David. At the time in which thou seest, O God, that he may reign over Israel by servant. And gird him with strength that he may shatter unrighteous rulers, and that he may purge Jerusalem from nations that trample her down to destruction. Wisely, righteously, he shall thrust out sinners from their inheritance. He shall destroy the pride of sinners as a potter's vessel. With a rod of iron, he shall break in pieces all their substance. He shall destroy the godless nations with the word of his mouth. At his rebuke, nations shall flee before him, and he shall reprove sinners with the thoughts of their hearts. All nations shall be in fear before him, for he will smite the earth with the word of his mouth. Those words are so very, very powerful. And as we continue on this day, it's important for us to realize that God has a plan for our life. For our life. The great philosopher Sartre, during World War II, who was actually a, a, captured by the Germans, began to write his existential philosophy or existentialism. And what he said at the end of World War II, he said, you know, individuals have within themselves to determine their future. And he says, what's happening as a result of World War II, people are leaving the church, and also families are falling apart. Well, there's another side to that, which I don't agree. He was an atheist. But the word of God is so strong that God has a plan for each and every one of us. We need to recognize that we are a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all a sinner. There are evil thoughts that come upon us. But God has a plan. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. But yes, as Sartre said, we do have in our own hands our future. But I want to take it a little bit further. Yeah, either to accept or reject Christ from a Christian perspective, not from an atheist perspective. And so, to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, and it's very simple to just say, in a simple little prayer, Lord, I am a sinner. Jesus Christ, I want to be Lord and Savior of my life. It's important. As I stand here today, I only have 10 more sermons to give until I retire. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you what, I'm not retiring, baby. It's just beginning. It is just Again, I am not going to retire. I may not be able here, but I'm going to be, Linda and I, we're going to be doing Bible study. We're going to be doing prayer. We're going to be reaching out. We're going to be doing alphas. We're going to be doing this and that. But anyone that wants to hear. But the thing is this, what I'm really worried about are our young people. Our young people. We need to bring them back. We need to bring them back. And with a new pastor coming, he has a young family with a new baby and a two-year-old, two little girls in his life. And I pray that you will support and be there for him and for the ministry of this church. You are good people. You are good people. This past week, three individuals, I'm in the bank and I'm in a hurry. And I'm writing out to, to take some money out of the bank, not to put in, to take out. And this guy, about six foot two, with a big beard, he said, he said, Pastor Ken, thank you. I didn't know who he was. And I said, excuse me, um, do you 
I, I'm trying to picture how I know you. He said, oh, he said, I want to thank you and your church for AA. I'm a member of AA on Tuesday nights, and St. Mark's is a great church. Thank you. And then there was a man walking just down the street with a cane, an older man, and he said, Pastor, I heard you're leaving. I said, well, yeah. And he said, I had the same problem you did with, with my spine and with my leg. And he said, what they found out is that I had to have a heart operation as a result of that. And he says, I'm getting over it. And he said, how are you doing? I said, well, you know, I'm starting physical therapy now. He said, well, I want to pray for you. And I said, and I want to pray for you as well. But then what really, so what I usually do on Sunday, we have breakfast and I went into this <laughs> coffee shop and I'm trying to get away from that again so I can work on the sermon, focus in for next Sunday. And I got up and I walked outside for about 20 minutes and I noticed that the, where I was sitting, it was like a church pew and there were three tables and there was a young lady sitting there, a lot of college kids on the computers. And I came back and I'm sitting there and I'm writing out here, St. Mark's. I said, St. Mark's. I turned around, it was a young lady, about 20 years old. I said, uh, how do you know about St. Mark's? She said, I'm Victoria. I play violin in your church. And Brendan, Brendan is my teacher when I was in elementary school. I'm in Westchester now. And I'm studying violin. And she's and like so full of energy. And she says, my 15-year-old sister. I said, well, she was very shy when she was here. She, she's studying a violin, too. I said, well, maybe she, you can come and play if you have time before I leave. And the last word she said to me, and I can't get it out of my head, before I left, she said, Pastor Ken, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I'm going back to my dorm tonight. Thank you for talking to me. You see, that's what life is about. It's reaching out and touching people. The Surgeon General was on television, and I was listening to his uh, interview, and he said one of the problems with the younger people today is that they're spending too much time on their laptops. You know, we have to not let them spend so much time on laptops. He says it's like putting them in a car without a seat belt and letting the car just go any speed it wants, ignoring stop signs and, and red lights and green lights. It's a tragedy. And so I pray that the church will wake up and realize that the young people today are the next generation of the church. And we need to listen to them. And we need to take time, as Victoria said, Thank you, Pastor Ken, for taking the time to talk to me. Not only young people, but older people, really anyone, we need to take the time to allow Christ to come into our hearts. You see, this is true of you and me. When it comes to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, we are all charity students. Jesus was a man of great humility. He rode into Jerusalem on a horse, he set into motion events he knew that couldn't be turned back. They resulted in his crucifixion and death, but here is the good news. He did it out of love for you and for me. Greater love has no one than this, says John, in chapter 15, verse 13, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We are Christ's friends, not because of any virtue that we have, but through the amazing love for all God's children. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Palm Sunday. We pray for peace throughout the world. We pray that this coming week will be a time of searching in our hearts for an eternal presence with Jesus Christ in your kingdom. Be with us this day, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our next hymn is hymn number 280. Let us sing.